The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, hi, everybody. Welcome to the Lunch and Learn series. I'm just hoping we're going to have a little bit more luck with our audio today. Um, so what I'm going to do is do a quick sound check to make sure. Now, if you go and look on the right-hand side, you'll notice there's a little box that says questions. Could I just ask you all to open that up? And could you just type in the word clear if I'm coming across loud and clear? Thanks, Tony. Thanks, Megan. Thanks, Ellie. Thanks, Jenny. Okay. All right. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully all will go well. I think one of the issues is that everybody's on this platform, which is GoToWebinar, and uh, and sometimes these things uh, get overloaded. So I'm hoping today will work well for us because it wasn't a great start to the Lunch and Learn series. So welcome, everyone. Now, a um, couple of things I want to say before we get underway. Uh, the first thing is that you'll get a copy of the slides and the recording at the end of every session, regardless of whether you attend or not. And the whole idea of that, of course, is either to review it or, you know, the reality is you just may not be able to make it at some stage and uh, you can watch it at your own leisure. So that's the first thing I want to say. The second thing is, of course, there are six units and they are generally spread out across uh, two weeks. So, which is about right, because if we did it once a week, it would be probably a little bit over, a bit too much. And uh, beyond two weeks, you'll probably have forgotten what I talked about the uh, the last time. So that's why. And during those two weeks, um, what I do is I set you some homework. Now, when I say homework, I'm talking about very practical things to do. Now, obviously, today's topic is about feedback. So you can imagine that the, the homework's going to be around feedback. But of course, that's the whole point, isn't it? That to, 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 to try things new and, and have a go at, at uh, various things. Uh, so that's about all at this stage. And the other thing is, I just say, you know, in terms of participation, anytime you've got a question or a comment or an observation, please go to the where you just typed in clear and you just write your question in. I can't unmute any, everybody, unfortunately, because ultimately there'd be too much background noise and we'd be creating a problem for ourselves. So the idea is that you can just uh, type in your question or your comment. Now, I'm the only one that gets to see that. No one else gets to see the comments. And then, of course, I refer to them. So don't be shy. If you've got something to say, please go ahead. Uh, I don't normally leave everything until the last minute and give you that 10 minutes to you know, formulate your own questions and so forth. It's just when you feel you want to ask something, just go for it or, or say something for that matter. All right, now th these are the six topics that we, we're covering and obviously I'll talk about the first one because that's what today's about. But um, essentially uh, you might say, well, why, why these six topics? Well, you know, generally speaking, these are the things that I think are really important when it comes to any leadership role. And um, feedback, of course, is critical, which I'll get into in more detail as I mentioned. You've got enhancing your influence now, uh, I'll be sending you out a diagnostic to do. It's up to you. It's purely optional whether you do it. Uh, but certainly in session two, I'm going to talk about influence because at the end of the day, you and I are both in the business of influence. You know, if we're not influencing other people, then other people are probably influencing us. But at the end of the day, we are all influencers and uh, we, we've got to learn to be more effective in the way we go about that. And I, I certainly want to talk about that. The profile will help you with that. In in unit three, I want to look at the uh, optimizing team performance. At the end of the day, um, you know, you may have a team of six people. How do you lift the team performance? What can you do to do that in local government? And uh, I want to talk a little bit about how we can do that. Um, having had a lot of experience in local government, uh, I, I'm well aware of some of the challenges and issues that you've got. In Unit 4, I want to talk about getting the very best out of people. Now, of course, that's always a challenge as well, but I, I don't think it's about getting everyone up to, say, 100%, but how can we get people perhaps from a 6 to a 7 or you know, a 5 to a 6 or whatever it might be. How do we get that little extra discretionary effort from people that we lead? And I want to talk about that too. 
In Unit 5, there's another diagnostic there. It's not an electronic one, but it's a paper one, and, and it's about personalities. And the, good, the, the whole idea of that is, of course, we've all had personality clashes. We will continue to have, and, and the whole purpose of that is to give you some indication of your own personality and your profile. And basically, it's about learning to deal with other people according to how they like to be dealt with, uh, which, of course, is the platinum rule. And the final thing is that, of course, in local government, you have lots and lots of meetings to attend. This is a meeting. After this, I'm sure you've got another meeting. It never ends. Now, many of those meetings, of course, you actually have to run. Uh, certainly, you would with your team. So it seems to me to make a lot of sense that getting good at running meetings is a really critically important role for any leader. So I do want to talk about that. And I do want to give you some tips on what will work for you. Because quite frankly, if you can run a really decent meeting, you're going to stand out like a sore thumb, basically, because we all attend many, many, many mindless meetings. And I think if we can make sure that our meetings are more effective, we're going to not only stand out in the crowd, but the people that attend our meetings will actually find some great value in coming to the meetings. So that's where we're going with the Lunch and Learn series. Um, if you've got any questions about the logistics of it, um, just go to the question box there and just type in your question and I'll be happy to answer it. All right, so, whoop, I went too far. Now, um, I, I think we sort of did that last time. I'll go straight into, uh, I'll go straight into this quote here. Um, now this, I, I just, you know, I just wanted to set it up by saying that here, here is a quote uh, from, from John Allen, who says basically that if performance reviews are the only time when feedback's given, that's a problem, but it's better than nothing. Now, unfortunately, of course, what a lot of leaders do is they save up their feedback for performance. And uh, I would suggest to you that that's not a good idea because obviously what happens is um, you know, there's a distance or time between when you should have been giving the performance and the performance review. So it's good to be giving uh, it's good to be giving feedback right at the time. That's both positive and constructive feedback, I might say. But so you know, what I'm trying to encourage you to do is to increase your amount of feedback to the people that uh, that you have. So you've got a bit of homework around that. But I would strongly recommend if feedback isn't something that you find easy, then start with positive feedback because um, it's easier to give positive feedback and uh, as long as it's genuine and, and, and heartfelt and you mean it, that's a very good thing. Even saying thank you to someone is feedback. So um, I just want you to bump up your feedback to other people. I think it's extremely important for you to do that. So here are some pretty uh, damning statistics, quite frankly. And if you look at these statistics from Deloitte, I'll just run through them with you very briefly. But I'm sure when you think, and I'm sure they weren't all about local government, but I'm sure many of them do are applicable to local government. So 60% of employees don't understand their organisational goals, uh, which basically means only 40% do. So do your people understand the strategic direction of what where council's going and do they understand the nature of what they do and how that actually does fit nicely into the strategic direction of your council? Now, the easy answer is yes, they do, but I wonder if they really do. Um, you may, but the point is do they? And what that means, of course, is if they don't, if they're not aware, then they're likely to be doing what some people might call fake work, that is work that's not directly or indirectly linked to the organisational uh, outcomes. 87% of employees aren't engaged in their work and 20% actually are actively undermining the value. Now, I'm not sure whether it's 87%, but all the surveys I see show me that at least 50% usually on average around 70% of people would be classified as what we might call disengaged. Now, that's a real worry because obviously um, that makes your job very, very difficult. And I'm sure you could cite some people that are disengaged in their work 
in your team. And if you haven't got anyone that's disengaged, well, congratulations, you'd be in the minority. 77% of employees say that their performance would improve with more feedback. So there we go, people want more feedback. Now you might be sitting there thinking, well, you know what, I don't get much feedback myself. But in my view, that's not a reason or an excuse not to be giving feedback to other people. I think it's, um, you know, you, you just have to do what you need to do as a good leader. So 50% of managers fail to hold their team members accountable and having the hard conversations. I think, you know, difficult performance conversations, which I will touch on, are not easy. But of course, uh, what we want to do is by, by if we're giving regular feedback, then hopefully we get to a stage where we don't need to have those hard conversations because things have been discussed and nipped in the bud. But I think where managers don't give feedback, you're opening yourself up for a really massive problem in terms of performance. And then the person turns around and says, oh, well, nobody ever told me that that was not the right thing to do, even though it's acutely obvious. 57% of employees say that they want more critical feedback. So here we are that the majority of employees generally want more critical feedback. They want to know how they're not how they're not going well as well as how they're going well. So, so obviously it's an important topic and you can understand why I'm covering it for those reasons. Now, if you look at the graph that I'm going to show you right now on your screen, you'll notice that uh, up the top there, uh, if you only ever gave positive feedback to your team members, blue by the way is positive, red is not. If you only ever gave positive feedback to your team members, then you're likely to have a significant bearing on the engagement levels of the team members. They're likely to be more engaged. That's great news. All you've got to do is catch people doing it right and give them that feedback. Interestingly enough, if you only gave critical feedback and not positive feedback, then your engagement levels are still reasonably high, as you can see in the middle bar. But what's the most interesting thing in this bar chart is the bottom one. If you don't give any feedback at all, whether it's positive or uh, you know uh, constructive, no feedback, it's likely that your disengagement levels will go down significantly. So there's a high level of correlation between engagement and feedback. So if you want more engagement in your team, the idea is, of course, to give people more feedback, whether it's positive or constructive. That's the message. Uh, let's look at this a little bit further. So roughly on you know, three to one uh, margin, employees believe that constructive feedback does more to improve their performance than positive feedback. So basically people are saying in a general sense, we want more feedback to let us know where the line in the sand is. Are we meeting your expectations and whatever it might be, the key performance indicators. So that's important to know. And I think another key point I'd like to make here is that the secret of actually getting people to actually listen to the feedback, in other words, to actually adopt your suggestions, is pretty much dependent on whether they respect you. Now, uh, now respect's not something where you can switch, you know, turn on a light, turn on a switch and then it just happens. But at the end of the day, uh, you, you're in the business of being respected and you'll find that what we're trying to do in the Lunch and Learn series is help you with that uh, in a variety of different ways. So uh, yeah, uh, and the truth is respect is earned. So it's incredibly hard to get and it's very easy to lose. It, you know, one, one incident from you and you can lose respect and then of course it, it takes, you know, several incidents, incidents for you to actually win people's respect. So that's, that, that is really, really important to think about. Um, now, obviously the Lunch and Learn series will help you garner that respect and so forth, but that might be something to think about. In other words, you can give the same feedback to two people and one who doesn't respect you will, will ignore it or even be critical of you for giving the feedback and the other one will go ahead and do what they need to do to remedy the situation. It's got nothing to do necessarily with the words you've used, the way you've done it. It's all about what their perception of you is. So um, yeah, I've done that. So what I'd like to do now is I'd like to ask you seven questions. 
and I'd like you to honestly answer these. I don't. When I say answer them, I want you to answer them in your in your mind. But I want these are really important questions because setting and managing expectations in your work area is extremely important. In fact, it's the starting point of all feedback. But it's not quite as simple as you might think. And uh, it's something that takes a little bit of complexity. So let's just walk through this and have a think about it. The first fundamental question that needs to be asked is, what are your expectations as a leader? Do you have some very clear expectations of what you expect from people in your team? Now, I, I would expect that's probably a yes. Uh, but that's an, that's an important starting point. So somebody new coming into a leadership role has to think very carefully about what the minimum acceptable standard of performance is. So what will they not tolerate? What will they tolerate? Where is that line in the sand, so to speak? So that's obviously the starting point with managing expectations is for you to be clear about what your expectations are. Once we've got a clarity around that, the next question we've got to ask ourselves is, have we communicated those expectations to our team? Now, you might say, well, I've done that several times, but of course, it's a never ending exercise. It's something that has to be done regularly, moment by moment, situation by situation. It should be done individually and it should also be done in the team context. But uh, you, you will find that just because you've said it once doesn't necessarily mean that people get it. So they really need to hear it several times for them to be absolutely crystal clear about what your expectations of them are. Um, so let's say that you've got some expectations and let's say you've communicated them. The question then really is, uh, do your team members actually understand your expectations? Now, you might say, yeah, I think they do, but do they really? I mean, it's very rare that people will actually say to their leader, look, I don't understand what these expectations mean or why they're in place. And obviously, if people aren't aware or understand what they mean or think they're irrelevant or whatever, then clearly they're going to ignore them. So that's critically important. So explaining why those expectations are important in the context of the work you do is extremely important. So once we've got you know that organised, the other issue that comes to into play is: Do your team members uh, accept your expectations? Now, um, I've seen this happen many, many times where people they nod dutifully when you give them an expectation around the work that's to be done, but they don't really accept it. And they may not accept it for a number of reasons. One might be that they've got a lot of balls in the air at once, lots of things on their plate. They might think it's just a ridiculous uh, bureaucratic uh, uh, interference in their work. There's all sorts of possibilities. So they need to accept the expectation before they'll do anything about it. And I guess that raises the next question. Are your team members committed to meeting those expectations now? What that basically means is that uh, uh, you, you need sometimes to ask for people's commitment to achieve those expectations. And there's nothing intrusive about it. I want you to try this. Say to people next time you've got an expectation. So, for example, if you said to somebody, um, look, I need this, I need this uh, report done by the close of business today. Let's say that's your expectation. Now, normally what happens is we'd turn around and walk away and, and we just make the assumption that the person who we just spoke to will be committed to meeting that expectation. Big mistake. What you need to do is then follow that up, which you've just said, I need to get this report done by the end of today. Can I get your commitment? That's the question. Can I get your commitment? There's nothing wrong with making, there's nothing wrong with asking that question. In fact, it's a very respectful question because what it's doing is, you, is, is precipitating perhaps one of three things, a nod or a grunt or a yes. And of course, there could be a no as well. Or there could be a bit of obfuscation around that. 
if there is a sort of a no or you know whatever then of course you can have a conversation with the person about that and then and, and reiterate its importance and and perhaps look at helping them reshuffle their priorities but of course if they say yes or they nod or they grant then the uh, the chances of that expectation being met goes up significantly because they've made a commitment to you albeit it might be non-verbal but they've made a commitment to you and therefore they're likely to follow through on that commitment so I definitely think that's worth a try I've just got a question here I'm just going to have a look at uh, uh, yeah Tony I oh, know it's not really a question but Tony you make a good point Tony asks or Tony says it can be frustrating conti frustrating continually confirming expectations yeah I look I agree Tony I've been in your shoes I know that I think that um, of course you know you've got to ask the question wonder why people aren't picking up on this and I wonder whether it might be that some of the other questions that I've gone through are the ones that uh, you know are the problem in other words they don't understand them or they don't, they, don't, they don't think they're important or they're not committed to them it could well be around that but look I think if you do all of these seven things right uh, Tony you'll you'll find that you will get a better result and that's essentially if it, look the bottom line is if you don't do some of these things uh, it won't be good okay all right so uh, number six is <clears throat> do people know how they're performing against those expectations and I think Tony that it that feeds into your statement this this of course is about feedback are you giving regular feedback to people about how they're going meeting the expectations that you've set and I think if you do that of course it's another way is it not to explain what your expectation is because if you're giving feedback obviously the person's going to be very clear about where the line in the sand is drawn so yes feedback comes into this significantly in question six now the last question is this are you supporting your team members to achieve those expectations now you might say yes I am but what I mean by that is are you moving organizational roadblocks that are getting in the way are you giving people the freedom and the tools and the opportunity to get the whatever it is done on time all of those things are part of your job to pave the way for them to be able to meet those expectations so I really urge you to consider that as well so you can see now it's quite complex um, and of course what it means is that if we miss any of those questions it's likely that we'll get sub-optimal performance from team members so I'd like you to keep those in mind and the really important one in my view well there's a couple of important ones there really but the really important ones is number five asking people for their commitment and I guess number six about giving feedback around their ex, you know what they've done in terms of your own expectations and uh, even number seven which is around removing blocks and organizational um, barriers that might be getting in the way of helping that person achieve a certain task all right moving on now I'm going to talk about some different characteristics that are important or elements let's put call them elements around giving feedback that I think are important Now they're not necessarily in any order but I would say to you that timing is really important now what I mean by that is that the sooner after an event as possible the better so I realize we're all busy and you may well be doing something else but the sooner you can give feedback to somebody after the incident or the behavior the better and I guess why is that <clears throat> well um, the sooner you do it the sooner the other person knows that you obviously see it as a critically important priority because otherwise you wouldn't have given that feedback so quickly so for example if there was a team meeting this morning and and somebody uh, raised an important issue that no one else had raised and um, you went to them straight after the meeting and you said thank you for raising that point it was really important that you did I'm pleased you did because it could have slipped through the cracks so thank you 
all right, now the other person knows full well that you're serious about it because it's fresh in their mind. You've just had the meeting. You've taken the time in the corridor to praise them for bringing up something that was important in the meeting. Now, contrast that to, uh, let's say, four months later during a performance review. And you said, look, four months ago, I remember you brought up an issue in a meeting that was important at the time. And uh, it was good that you did that. Now, look, it's better than nothing, as I said earlier, but the truth is it's lost its sting because the other person thinks themselves, well, really, if it was that important, why wouldn't you have told me that four months ago? True. So that becomes uh, really important. Timing is very important. So you really have to go out of your way to create that timing. So by all means, ask any questions about any of these folks because, you know, um, it's important that you engage that way. Now, one of the things I think is very important as well is you've got to be specific about your feedback. Now, what I mean by that is if you just give generalised feedback, then it's not good because you keep the other person guessing. And I think there's a little bit of nonsense that's written about this. You know, we call it the so-and-so sandwich, you know, where you get a bit of positive feedback to start with and then the negative feedback. And at the end, you get the poor, you know, you get the good feedback. So you sort of bury the, the negative feedback in between two pieces of bread, which are positive. I think this is absolute nonsense. I mean, at the end of the day, what are you trying to do? You're trying to soften the blow. Why are you softening the blow? Because you don't want to hurt the feelings of the other person. Well, look, I'm not suggesting you should hurt the feelings of the other person, but really um, that's not a very good way of doing things. So let's have a look at some examples of giving effective feedback. Imagine if I gave you this feedback. I said to you, overall, good job on the presentation at this morning's meeting, but it could have been better. I've said that to you. Now, just type into the question box, if I said to you overall, good job on the presentation at this morning's meeting, but it could have been better, just type in, how, tell me what your impression would be of that feedback. I'll just give you a moment for some people to type in a, an answer. What, what, what might be your reaction to that? How might you think, all right, so here we go. So Ellie says, I would be wondering how it could be improved. It been better, absolutely. Or even worse, Ellie, it could be, what have I done wrong? Tony says, you need to improve. Yeah, Tony, that would be the thrust of it, wouldn't it? Uh, so yeah, and Jenny says, need to know what I could do better. Absolutely. So in other words, you, you can see that the person said, overall, good job on the presentation this morning. Now, all of that's completely devalued because of the next sentence, but it could have been better. And of course, sometimes when you're on the receiving end of that sort of feedback, you don't feel assertive enough to ask, what was it? Okay, so you walk away wondering, what in heaven's name did I do wrong at, the, at this morning's meeting? It doesn't actually work very well for you. So let me have a look at this. Let me show you what might look better. Have a read of this. I'll, I'll read this through and, and tell me what you think. And I'd like to hear your feedback on the on the in the chat box there. So if I said to you instead, great job on the presentation. I really liked how you use statistics to back up your key points. One small comment, maybe for next time you'd be able you you could be you could invite more comments from the group to get them more involved. How does that go across? Let me have a look and see what you think. Um, what, just tell me how would that have come across to you if I'd said that, the second one, which I'd like to think is a little more specific. Um, any comment? Did it hit the mark, folks? Just type in your answer. Yeah, okay, thanks, Dev. Yes, a much more specific and positive says, Ellie, thank you. Yeah, look, and, and you know, um, I think it is very constructive and positive. Yeah, a little bit more detail would be beneficial and some ideas. Thanks, Jenny. Thanks, Nicole. That's good. I think I, 
I think is very constructive and positive. Good. Yeah, look, I think you'll find and specific and overall positive. Thanks, Megan. And hi, Megan. Long time no see. Um, look, the if you actually gave somebody that feedback, what would happen would be uh, uh, the, the, the you know they would think you know they might even agree with you. They might say, "Oh, I was a bit nervous and and I just didn't feel comfortable." Um, you know, I didn't feel comfortable getting everyone engaged, but I, I understand. So in other words, it's not only is it clear, it's also likely to be accepted. And I think that's what Nicole was getting at when she said, I think it's very constructive and positive. So you see now what that means is, of course, you've just got to think carefully before you open your trap. So don't just jump in and say whatever you think. I want you to have a think about how you can express it specifically. All right. Now, there's no sugarcoating there. Um, it, it got to the point. So, so you can see the difference that that could make. All right. The third concept around this is um, frequency. Now, what I'm talking about here is that feedback should be moment by moment, situation by situation. It should be done basically daily, and I think you should be looking for opportunities to do that all the time, all right? So I really want you to really focus on this. Look, guys, you'd be so surprised at how incredibly effective this whole thing will be. If you can start doing this more regularly, you'll find that productivity will go up, uh, energy levels will go up, empowerment will go up, You'll find people will get things done with less effort. It, it's you'll be surprised, and so it's one of the obvious things. But but again, common sense is not always common practice. But what I want you to do is to do it on a regular basis. Okay. Next point is what I think you should do with feedback. It's not you sitting there giving someone a monologue. Uh, I think what you should try and do is ask questions. All right, so for example, I might say to somebody to get things rolling, I say, how did you think the presentation this morning went? Now I was there, but I'm asking, how did you think the presentation went this morning? I wanna hear what they've got to say about it. That gives me a chance to catch my breath. Okay, now if they say to you, oh, look, I think it went okay, I probably could have got people more involved then what can I say to that? I can say, well, look, I have 100% agree. I think that that would be my only comment. I think it you know, could have got people more involved. But overall, I thought the way you use statistics was fantastic, you see? So the problem is, of course, that most of you have been put in this position where you um, have learned to answer questions, not ask questions, because anyone that's done any courses or any tertiary study or anything like that the whole point of it is to do is to learn how to answer questions now tony's asking a great question should you provide feedback in private this is a brilliant question tony can i get can i just park that for a moment please i i will be dealing with that very shortly you're you're, you're a mind reader but i just just thank you for raising it though so ask open-ended questions, why, what, when, who, where, how, and which. If you do that, what you'll find is that uh, you're taking all the emphasis on, off yourself and putting it on the other person, which I think is really the, the, the key in all of this. So ask more questions. Now let's get to Tony's point. Uh, should Now I, I'll just raise what Tony's asked, and what I'm going to do is ask the rest of you to answer Tony's question and then I'll give you my two cents worth. Tony's asking, should feedback be given in private? Now, remember, feedback can be both positive and constructive. Could I ask others of you today who are in this workshop, should feedback be given in private? Give Tony some feedback about his question. Let's see what you come up with. And Tony, of course, you can answer your own question because, I mean, I'm sure you've got an opinion about it as well. All 
All right, no one, no one wants to have a go at that. Ah, here we go. Thanks, Jenny. It should depend on the. Oh, they're all sorry. I just had to give you time to type, didn't I? Um, Jenny says it should depend on the situation, whether it is whether it's sensitive or just general. Thanks, Jenny. Um, Dev says negative feedback. I prefer to give privately. Absolutely, I agree, Dev. And Megan says, depends on the context. If the feedback would benefit the whole team and as a manager, you can be positively constructive with your feedback, I think it could be done in public. Okay, good. And uh, Nicole says, depends on the circumstances. If the matter involves the whole team, this could be done in the team meeting. Also depends on the type of feedback, says Nicole. And Ellie says, if private, if, if negative private, I like giving positive in front of others to boost morale. Now, Ellie, I just wanted to talk about that for a moment. I wanted to just um, play devil's advocate here for a minute. If I, I know what you look, first of all, let's get one thing out of the way. Um, if the team wants feedback, obviously you'd have to give that to the team. So that would be done in public. Or when I say public, it would be done just with the team. So I don't have a problem with that. That's fair enough. But I do have a concern when I hear people say, uh, criticise in private and praise in public. And I'll tell you why, because I think there are some people who actually feel uncomfortable uh, being made the centre of attention in the workplace. You know, I'm talking perhaps introverts who may not want to be, you know, made, you know, have attention brought to them for something that they did, regardless of whether it was positive or negative. So I think the question there is really, uh, if you want to play it safe with people, I would I would give all feedback in private. Um, now, just remember this, the feedback is still going to be effective, whether it's in private or public, in the sense that just because you give it privately, it doesn't mean it's any less sincere. In fact, in many ways, it can come across as more sincere. So I think you've got to be careful with that because I'm sure some of you who are in this webinar today probably don't feel completely comfortable if you're singled out, you know, in a public forum necessarily, but you do appreciate nevertheless the feedback that's given to you. So I think the answer to that excellent question that Tony asked is perhaps we should err on the side of giving feedback in private, regardless of whether it's positive or constructive. And Tony's just answering his question by saying, yes, I prefer private, but many different opinions out there. Absolutely. So my sense is private, Tony. I'm with you on that. So have a think about that, folks. But look, I, I do, I have, you know, I work across 21 industries and I do see people, you know, having a huge, big sort of morning tea or something and they want to make a song and a dance about someone. And I often wonder to myself whether or not the feedback's really about making the manager look good, you know, the fact that they're praising one of the team members, or is it really about the person on the receiving end? Of course, it's supposed to be about the person on the receiving end. So if that, in fact, is the case, then I would suggest that it be done in private. There's no need for, there's no need to make that public, unless, of course, um, it's a team effort, or as people have said. So different points of view there, but just be mindful that not everyone appreciates feedback in public. Now, the very best way of giving feedback, of course, is to use critical incidents or particular examples, because when you use concrete examples, then obviously the person um, is, you know, they know what you're talking about. Now, of course, I know what some of you are thinking. Some of you are thinking, well, you know, sometimes um, I'm not there or I haven't seen it or whatever, and that's fair enough. Uh, you won't always see things. But I think if you can give people an, a critical example, an example of what you're talking about, then it makes a lot more sense to the individual on the receiving end. So try to use examples to back up your feedback. And just remember, folks, that feedback is ultimately about the future. It's not about the past. And what I mean by that is that there's only two reasons for you and I to give feedback. And the first reason is to change some behavior that's happened in the past for the future. 
So in other words, if I'm giving constructive feedback, it's about getting people to do something different in the future. Or the other reason I'm giving feedback, which is positive feedback, is because I want people to continue to do what they're doing because it is actually useful. I want them to continue that in the future. So it's always about the future. And I think it's always about trying to shape the future. That's what feedback's about. So think about it that way. I think it's important. Now, um, let me talk about some uh, other issues that you'll find, particularly for the difficult conversations, because let's face it, the difficult conversations are stressful for everybody, not just you, but also the person on the receiving end. But I think the point I would make is that some people may want to argue with you in these com so-called conversations, difficult conversations. I would suggest to you not to argue. I think this is the worst thing that you can do. And I think you've just got to take a deep breath and maintain your calm. And in fact, it's the only way. Now, I, you know, people say, oh, should we cancel the meeting or, well, why? I mean, if I mean, at the end of the day, if the other person, um, is it going to make it any easier next time around? I'm not sure. But I, there's two tactics you can use here. One is to say to the other person, I refuse to argue with you about this. Now, if you say that, then basically you're saying to the other person, I'm not going to argue about it. Um, I've just got a message here uh, that's OK. My network's going a bit slow. I'm going to turn off the webcam, folks, because um, I'm just worried about the audio. By the way, can I just do a quick sound check? Could you just type in, am I still coming across loud and clear? Could I just get the word clear, please? Are you breaking up? Yeah, I'm getting that feedback here, Jenny, as well. So. Look, I'm going to plough on because I think we're obviously um, on the home stretch, um, but it's unfortunate that I'm getting that feedback. So, all right, so I'll turn off the webcam and that way, of course, it just reduces the bandwidth somewhat. So let me keep going uh, and hopefully we can get through to the end. So don't, don't argue. And the other thing you can say to people is, another thing you can say is, Let's agree to disagree um, on a minor matter, of course, and something, you know, so that way you can move on. You don't have to stay there and be stuck in that situation. Now, another thing is always focus on the, on the performance, not the person, because at the end of the day, you're giving feedback about the performance, not the person. So it's very important to do that. Um, Hopefully that makes sense. As I've said before, the focus is on the future, not the past. So the whole idea is to, to talk about what has to happen for the future, which is critically important, of course. And uh, it's it's perfectly acceptable for you to talk about people's strengths as well. And I, and I think the very least you can do when you're giving strong feedback to someone that's negative is to say to them, look, I'm confident that you can we can get this sorted out. So in other words, you're giving the person a degree of confidence that you believe that they can change their behaviour. Now, of course, if you haven't, if you're not confident that they can change their behaviour, then I'd have to ask you the question, well, why are you giving them the feedback? So there must be some degree of confidence that you can change the behaviour, otherwise you wouldn't be doing it or shouldn't be doing it. So therefore, it's perfectly reasonable for you to let the person know that. All right. And the final thing is, of course, sometimes things are a little bit complicated. So be prepared to ask questions to, to, to find out what, you know, what the, you know, what sort of the causes are, because sometimes you can make assumptions about the cause and it could be a lot more than what it is. All right. A couple of other things about difficult conversations that we can continue. And one is get straight to the point. When I say get straight to the point, what I'm referring to there is none of this chit chat at the end of the day um, you know people sort of want to have a bit of small talk before they have these very difficult meetings it's no good don't do it it's not going to make anyone feel more comfortable in fact if anything it'll make people feel more stressed because they're waiting for you to get to the point so get straight to the point I don't mean in an aggressive way but just get straight to what you want to say so you might say 
the purpose of our meeting today is, and then you launch into what you've got to say. Now, um, what you need to do at this stage is you need to explain the purpose of the meeting and do it in a clear way. And when you've explained the purpose of the meeting, the, the key thing is to try to encourage the other person to speak because that takes the pressure off you. If you're doing all the talking in a conversation about poor performance, then it's not going to go very well. So you stop and you give the other person a chance to respond. Now, while they're responding, uh, something very important must happen or not happen. You must bite your tongue until it bleeds. And the point I want to make there is you are not to interrupt them no matter what they say. Even if they say something that's completely and utterly wrong, you just listen. Now, when the person draws breath, you can then say to them, look, there's a couple of things you said there I'd just like to respond to, and then you go off and respond to those things. Um, now, of course, you've got high credibility because uh, if they start interrupting you, you can say, well, hang on, I've given you a chance, so I'd appreciate the same opportunity or same courtesy. Okay, thanks, Megan. I realise that. We're just about to wrap up. Um, um, that's just a bit disappointing. Sorry about that. So we're going to wrap up shortly. I'm going to give you your homework, but thanks, Megan, for the feedback, even though um, <laughs> I'd rather hear something else. Here's your homework, guys. I'm done anyway, so I want you to give positive feedback three times a day for a week. I want you to actually have a go at that. So has everyone got that one? That's your homework. And um, I'm going to catch you uh, in two weeks. So uh, in two weeks' time, I'll see you. So I just want to say bye. See you in a couple of weeks. Have a fantastic weekend. We'll catch you in two weeks. Thank you and goodbye.